working on your pies, it will take hours. So don't bother at this point um, with putting it on your pie. Okay, just put it on your regular computer. No problem. Right? Huh? Yeah, nice try. So, uh, yeah, just, just don't put it on your Pi. Uh, it's, basically, there are two options. One is you have to upgrade the OS to the uh, next revision and the next kernel and all of that. And if you do so, that takes about five hours of sitting there watching the terminal do stuff. Or you back up all your files, you pop the SD card out, and you re-image it with the next image, like we did at the very beginning of the semester. But then you have to back up all your stuff and then reconfigure the Pi, and so on, okay? So uh, basically, at this point, just don't bother. Just use your regular computer for it. Um, it's not worth the trouble right now, okay? So, uh, but anyway, I've already done that on here. Um, Okay, so there are a couple of components that I wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about last time, uh, namely the plexers and the decoders. So there are, in the gates section, you've got all of the gates. Some of them have quick icons up here, the ones that you use pretty commonly, but not all of them are there. For example, the XNOR gate is, does not have one of them up there, and you need that for the equality checker. Um, so, uh, but what we, I want to do is talk about the plexers situation, because you need these for the barrel shifter. Um, okay, so there are three of them, three of these components, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> the one on the left is called a multiplexer, mm -hmm. or MUX for short. The middle one is a demultiplexer. It's basically just a multiplexer but goes instead of the reverse direction. And then a decoder is a special version of a, a demultiplexer um, that we'll, we'll see in a second what, what it does. So the idea of a multiplexer or a demultiplexer, I mean, they kind of work in, in uh, sort of symmetric fashion, is so let's suppose that you have like a really old computer, okay, and it has like um, you know, you would want some peripherals to go with this really old computer. Like maybe you have a printer and maybe you also have a scanner and maybe you have a fax machine cook connected to it. I don't know. Right. Well, what would happen, uh, if the computer was not able to use all three simultaneously? Okay then what you would have to do is connect these either to a multiplexer or a demultiplexer. And let me delete this guy, and uh, we'll deal with him later. So you could, for example, say, all right, I'm going to connect. Um, let me use the pins. Let's say that I've got, and let me change this to two select bits, and let's say eight data bits. All right, so let's say that I had a printer and I had a scanner. And let's say I also had a fax machine, uh, whatever. Do you guys even know what a fax machine is? Has anybody ever used one? Has anybody ever faxed somebody anything? Mm. That it was, but anyway. Okay, so what I would do is I'd connect, say, this guy to, oh, and I need to make these 8 bits. Okay, so I'm just going to suppose that, um, just for the sake of demonstration, that... Um, the, uh, the devices are all 8-bit devices, right? They could be 64-bit devices or whatever. That doesn't really matter. It's just, uh, um, you know, they're things that I'm passing data to. And I'll connect this one to this guy and this guy to this guy. Okay. And then I would have my source data here, okay, that would come from my processor or, you know, 
whatever. Um, and I'll make that 8 bit. Okay. And then I need another thing to select. Oh, it can't be called select. Okay. And I'm going to connect this here. Okay. Well, and then change this to, say, 2 bits. Okay, the reason I picked 2 bits here is um, if I have 4, like, how many different patterns can be encoded with a 2-bit string? 4 such patterns, right? And so if I have 4 devices, I mean, I've only got 3 connected here, but if I have, say, 4 devices, then I need 2 bits to decide which device I'm going to connect. So what the demultiplexer or multiplexer, it just kind of works in reverse order, um, does is it allows the source data to be connected to exactly one of the things on the other side. So it can be connected to the printer or the scanner or the fax, but only one at a time. Okay. And so let's say that I was using some old computer and I wanted to scan something and then print it, right, say to copy it or something, okay, then what I would have to do is connect the scanner, scan it, get the data to the computer, save it in memory somewhere, then turn off the scanner, switch the, the, the port to the printer, and send the data back to the printer. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So only one of the, the, the devices or one of the, the things on the right is connected at any given time, but I can always select between them and uh, sort of in a in a in a, a, a computer or software controlled sense decide which device is connected at any given time. And I do that by changing the select bits. Okay. So let me just say, for sake of example here, let me make this source data. Uh, well, two things. One, let me encode it in hex instead of binary. Um, and let me just change it to some bit pattern. Okay, and I'm just picking that randomly. Okay, so you notice my select bits right now are zero, zero. So which device is going to get connected? The printer, which is the zeroth device. Okay, and it may be a little hard to see on the screen, but you see this little zero right there up at the top? Right, that tells you which end is the zero end, and then they go down from there. Okay, um, and if I change the select bit to a one, then notice where the data goes this time to the next device. And if I make it one one, or sorry, one zero, now it's uh, sending the data to the fax. Okay, uh, and yeah. You seem befuddled, Cole. Ah, because I've the select bits, I've chosen the facts. So the data is being sent to the is so this the source data and the facts are connected. But the other two are disconnected. And if I change the bits. Right, it changes which one gets the copy of the data. Right, so does that kind of make sense? Uh, yeah, because I don't have something connected to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so oh, it can't be one one zero zero is the top one, right? Yeah, uh, simply because I don't have it. Well, I mean, it could be one one, but it's just there's nothing connected there, right? So it, I wouldn't use that. Um, well, actually, no, maybe I could, because maybe for for some reason I want to have none of them connected, right? Like if I'm in an idle state or something, like don't connect the printer unless you're about to use the thing. I don't know, right? Um, yeah, okay. But uh, so this here was a demultiplexer with two select bits and hence four things that be connected, but I can make these things as big or small as I want. Okay, um, you know, now obviously in the printer, scanner, fax kind of situation, that's um, 
kind of a contrived example, okay, um, but let's say that, for example, I'm building uh, my arithmetic unit like you guys are doing, right? How many different subunits did you build with your arithmetic unit? Well, you had an adder, you had a, a logical op uh, thing, so either an and or 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 x or whichever one you picked, it doesn't really matter. Okay, but let's say that you had done all of them, right? So you have an addition unit, a subtraction unit, an and, an or, a xor, uh, a logical shift thing, right? You got all of these different subunits, and you want to select which one you send data to in order to do a computation. Well, you're going to do that with the multiplexers and multiplexers, right? So instead of printer, scanner, fax, this could have been addition unit, XOR unit, AND unit, rotate unit, so on. Okay, and then just however many of them you got. Right, does that make sense? Uh, okay, so the, the select bits, basically how many selection bits you have, controls how big the demultiplexer is and how many things you can connect to it, right? So if you have in select bits, then how many uh, things can be connected to either a demultiplexer or multiplexer? So the number N, like the letter N, if there are N select bits, then how many things get, get to be connected? Nope, way more than that. Nope. Two to the N, because it's binary, right? Right, so if I've got two select bits, how many objects did I get? Four, T two squared. If I had three select bits, I'd get two cubed, which is eight, and so on, right? Hmm? Well, right now it only has four, because I've only got two select bits. Yeah, but if I make the select bits have three select bits, then this would have eight things, okay? Um, and if it had four select bits, it would have 16 things and so on. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so a multiplexer does exactly the same thing, but it's just sort of flipped, right? So that would be the situation where, like, let's say that you had um, a, um, uh, we would use the multiplexer there for the arithmetic unit. So like, let's say that we send data to the logic unit, the adder, the ander, the subtractor, all of these things, okay? And, and in practice, the way that, that you build an ALU is you actually send the data to all of the subunits and they all do the computation and you just pick which one you, you're taking. Um, and so you could do that with the multiplexer on the output side, okay? Um, but the function of the multiplexer and the function of the demultiplexer are basically identical. It's just the multiplexer is taking multiple things and going to a single uh, line of output, and you're selecting which input gets connected to the output. The demultiplexer is going the other direction. You've got a single input, and you're selecting which output it goes to. But the function is otherwise identical. Okay? All right. Now... The decoder is a special version of the demultiplexer where there's no data bits. Okay. It otherwise, oops, sorry. And I'm not sure why that aired out. Oh, it's because I accidentally deleted that. Okay, hold on. Uh, all right, so let me fix this. Okay, well, I've, I've, I've broken it. Whatever, you get the idea. Okay, so a decoder is like a version of the multiplexer. So let me make this a two-bit decoder. Okay except 
there's no data input. Okay, so the select bits are, in this case, I made it a two bit decoder. Okay, just say. Okay, so now let me, for sake of just demonstration, I'm just going to put four lights here. And, and I'm just thinking of these as to indicate what the outputs are. Nothing, nothing special. Okay. Um, and so, okay. So, now watch the select bits. Same idea, except I'm not passing eight bits or however many bits worth of data. The decoder only passes a single bit, okay? And <clears throat> it just tells me basically which one, like, so if I have two, two input bits or two select bits, there are four possible bit patterns, right? Zero, zero, one, zero, excuse me, zero, one, and one, one. Right? And this just tells me which pattern do I have? The zeroth one, the first one, the second one, or the third one? Okay. Um, so it's called a decoder. Um, and how would we use this thing? Well, <clears throat> let's think back to, well, for those of you guys who took 101 with me, and you guys remember doing the Brookshire assembly, right, the, the baby assembly, uh, or maybe, you know, since we did ARM, when we looked at the listing files, what was the whole point of that? Why did we make listing files if we already had the assembly? Yeah, we could see how the instructions were encoded, okay? And so let's say, and, and I'm just gonna make this up for sake of demonstration, that, so how long was each instruction uh, in our architecture? Every instruction was exactly how long? 32 bits. Okay, every single one. Right? Okay, so if you have 32 bits instructions, right, so let's say, for example, the add two registers together instruction. All right, so, and I'm just picking that for sake of demonstration. So we'd have something like, something like this, right? Take XR and XS, whichever numbers those are, add them together and put the results in XD, okay? How many registers did we have? Integer registers, huh? Well, there's three involved in the operation, but how many total of them are there, huh? There's 32 of the, uh, reg the integer registers, okay? How many bits does it take to encode 32 things? Well, two bits gets you four, three bits gets you eight, four bits gets you 16, so how about five bits, right? Okay, so I need five bits to encode each of the three registers numbers, okay? And so I'm gonna spend five of them here for and, and this is not necessarily in the exact order that actually is, but for sake of demonstration, it's good enough. All right, so I've got five there, five there, and five there. Okay? Uh, there's a single bit at the front on most of these that um, selects whether or not it's a W or an X, uh, which one it's using, right? Uh, zero for W, one for X. Okay, so in this case, if we were adding X registers, that would need to be a one. But if we wanted to be able to do Ws, it would be a zero, okay? So all of this stuff in the front, right? All of this stuff 
um, is going to encode what kind of operation it is, right? And so there's going to be a binary pattern here that basically tells us, if we looked at it, this is an addition operation, okay? And that chunk of stuff is the op code, okay? And uh, now, that may seem, so if we've got 32 bits to encode the instruction and we're spending 15 on picking which register numbers, how many bits are left to encode the instruction that we're doing? Can we do basic arithmetic or is it too early for that? 17. Okay, so there are 17 bits remaining to encode what the instruction is. Now that may seem like a, a lot, and it kind of is, how many different things could you encode with 17? And actually, let's just say 16, because we're going to spend one to decide if it's a W version or an X version, right? So let's just say 16 remaining, okay? Um, two to the power of 16, right, would be the total number of things that we could encode there, right? That's a lot, okay? But we've seen that our architecture also has a lot of instructions, right? So for example, with the add instruction, how many different versions of the add instruction are there? There's four, right? Add, add C, add S, and add CS. So there's four right there, right? And that's just for addition. Well, there's gonna be the same thing for subtraction, multiplication, division, Logical shifting, loading numbers, uh, loading numbers where you have logical shifts, right, involved with uh, that you guys saw when we did the, the move K, move N, move Z assignment, right? So, like, the number of operations or different, different types of operations is getting pretty big pretty quickly, right? Okay, so <clears throat> the a decoder is what you can use to sort out, well, which operation am I doing right now? Okay, and then um, if I know which operation I'm doing, then I can set control lines accordingly. All right, so let's say that, that the fourth light on here uh, indicates that it's supposed to do an addition. Okay, whatever. So I know, okay, I'm doing an addition right now. Well, that means I need to make sure that the addition unit in my ALU is activated. And if I've got this one line that's on, I can use that to turn on the parts that are needed in the processor to do whatever operation it is I'm doing. And then when I go and load the next instruction and I decode it and it says, oh, okay, now I want you to do an AND, well, then I decode it and say, okay, well, now I don't need the addition unit anymore. I'll turn on this other stuff, right? And the decoder is, well, a tool to make that happen, okay? Uh, now, in Logisim, and, and you'll see why if you think about it for a second, um, what is the limitation on the decoder for how many select bits I get? Five, okay? Why is that limitation built into this program? Well, if I have five select bits, how many output lines do I get? which is 32, right? Well, that's a lot of them. It's gonna take up the whole screen. So if I had more than five bits, like say six bits, and there'd be 64 of these little dots to connect to stuff, that's starting to get a little bit ridiculous, okay, in terms of drawing it, okay? So in that case, you do something slightly different um, for decoding which is you use what's called a decoder ROM. <clears throat> okay, and I'll show you what this is. Um, so, um, those of you who took 101, remember the Brookshire opcodes? There were only 16 of them. So, a uh, 2 to 4 decoder would be perfect for that. Or, sorry, a 4 to 16 decoder would be perfect for that. Yeah. That's the maximum number that you can use with most of these things because 
it just gets really, really big, right? So that, that's a software limitation, not a hardware limitation. You could build a decoder that has as many things as you want. It would just get unwieldy complicated, though. And there's no need to actually do that because there's this another way to uh, tackle this exact same problem. <clears throat> okay. And that's with a decoder ROM. Okay. So let me delete this. And I'm going to go over here to memory. Okay, so so let's just take for sake of example, let's pretend that the opcode in ARM is always exactly 16 bits, okay? Is that all right? Okay, now that's not entirely true, right? There are, the, the, the encoding for the ARM architecture um, <clears throat> actually has um, uh, the, the, the opcode part of it is not the same for every instruction, but you can group them into kind of like three families of different types of encodings and so, um, which of course would then complicate this a little bit. So let's just pretend that all instruction opcodes are exactly 16 bits. Okay. All right. So if I wanted a decoder here to be able to determine which of the two to the 16 different uh, things I ha are active at a given moment, or which one is, right? If I built this with a decoder, a 16-bit decoder, or 16 select bits, would have two to the 16 little outputs. Well, that's going to be just a crap ton of these things, okay? So the better approach is to treat this just like you would computer memory and think of the 16 bits as an address and the control bits that would go with it as the data that's in memory at that address, okay? So, for example, let's just say that all zeros is the addition, right? Then um, what am I passing into my ROM here? Okay, so right now what's the input to the, this ROM? All zeros. All zeros. Okay, and you see how that there's that one box of zero, zero highlighted? Okay, that's the, the memory address that's being highlighted right now uh, because that's the one that matches the address select thing, okay? And then the data that's in it, let me just ma uh, make an output pin here. Okay. And in this case, I'm outputting eight bits worth of data, and I just picked eight kind of semi-arbitrarily. And let me make this be in, well, actually, I'll leave it in binary, okay? Um, okay, so if I change the input, then it moves to the next memory address. And if I change and do, like, say, this one, it's way down there, right? Yeah, these are in hex. Mm -hmm. No, it's zero through seven, so that's eight. Oh, <clears throat> okay. But there's yeah, th there's two two numbers here. It's how many addresses you have. Uh, so what, say again, two to the sixty-four. Oh. Okay, yes, uh, be, well, okay, so how many memory addresses are there in, on, the, on uh, a 64-bit processor can address two to the 64 cells, right, which is a crap ton. Okay, so the, the, 
the thing that's coming out on the right hand side here is not going to be all 2 to the 64. What I'm thinking about this is that this is going to be how I do a control logic to say what things need to be turned on and what things need to be turned off. Okay, for sake of demonstration, I'll just suppose that there are just eight things, like the addition unit, uh, write to memory, read from memory, what on. Okay, in a real processor, it's going to be more like, well, a, a simple real processor, more like 16 to 32 different things that we would need. Um, but for just sake of demonstration, I'm just going to do eight. Okay, is that all right? Okay, so, the, but the addresses here in this ROM, okay, and let me be clear, this ROM is not memory of the computer, right? So RAM and ROM are two different things. Okay, what's the difference? Speed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, ROM, well, what does RAM and ROM stand for? And what does ROM stand for? Read only, okay? Meaning it gets programmed in the factory and it's what's in that data or what's in memory there or the, the ROM memory never changes, okay? Um, and if I were designing a processor, that's okay because my decoder ROM, well, it's that's the processor, right? It's not as if the, the circuitry of the processor is gonna get updated tomorrow right? I mean, it, it, well, okay, to be fair, it does, but then how do you update the circuitry in your processor? You buy a new processor, right? You don't just get to open up the processor and switch a few wires around, like it doesn't work that way. Uh, okay, so um, I would use a decoder ROM or I could use a decoder ROM. There's some other ways to do this too, but uh, that is certainly a way to do it, okay? Uh, when you have more select lines or select bits than five, um, because more than five just gets unwieldy to use with uh, a demultiplexer. I mean, you could do it, right? There's no hardware reason you couldn't do it, but um, it's just, there are better approaches for when you have a large number of select bits. Okay. Um, now, that said, this is exactly how we also build memory, like RAM memory. Okay, so RAM memory and ROM memory, you can have multiple of them. Okay, um, and in this case, you see how it says 64K by 8 up at the top? Why does it say that? Well, how many data bits are in each memory cell? That's the X8 because I made it 8-bit cells. Do they have to be 8-bit cells? No. Okay, that the convention is that they're usually 8-bit cells, but they don't have to be. Okay, and then the 64K on the other, uh, before the X, is telling me, well, how many memory addresses are there? Well, why are there 64K here? Well, how many bits did I use to encode the address? 16, right? Because my input there has four hex characters, That's and they're four bits each, so that's 16 bits. Well, what's two to the 16? 64K, or 65,536, okay? Incidentally, Cole, uh, why was the Commodore 64 called the Commodore 64? 64K of RAM. Okay, so these 8-bit processors of the day, the, the 6502 included, okay, could address 16 bits was the address width, which meant that the maximum RAM or maximum things that could be addressed was 2 to the 16 or 64K. Right, that's it. Right, so you get for next semester... 64K of RAM, period. That's it. Right? And nowadays, you guys write a paper in Word, and that's one page, and it's already bigger than 64K. Right? <laughs> a 
which is kind of ridiculous, but yeah. Okay, uh, I saw a hand that was moving in a question-oriented position. No. Wake up, Chad. What is Huh? Um, maybe, I don't know, right? It depends, like, well, like, if, if Giancarlo does it, it's going to be like, bobbity boobity. No? Yeah, there you go, right? Making a, you know, Italian joke, right? And if it's, like, Swedish chef, then it would be, yeah, no? He has the Swedish chef from the Muppets. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I, I guess it depends. How do you use your hands to talk, right? You know, if we, if we really use them and get, you know. So, anyway. Uh, okay. So, right. So, RAM and ROM. Um, and in this case, right, I picked eight bits as the contents of each memory address semi-arbitrarily. Um, I could make this bigger, but... Yeah. Um, okay. Now, in this case, right, um, the what I would do then is take each of those eight bits and use them to control whether or not different devices or different subunits of my processor were on or off at any given time. Okay. Now, the time part, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated than this. Um, let's say that I wanted to do the operation of adding two registers together and outputting back to a register. Okay, think about this in a series of steps. What's step one? I have to take the data from each of the source registers and send them both to the uh, addition unit. Step two, the addition unit has to actually add them and that doesn't happen instantaneously. And then I have to then take the, the answer data and write it back to the appropriate register. Okay, that only say maybe took two sub steps, right? But in terms of the processor's operation, like what controls what time it is? What controls what time it is on the processor? There's only one object that we have to do that, and that's a clock, right? And so you can sort of think of this as you know, there's a conductor and there's a beat. Right, and every time that the beat, the drum, you know, beats, I say, okay, beat quickly, change all the control lines so that the uh, those two registers are getting connected to the addition unit of the ALU, and the ALU is set to addition mode. The addition happens. Beat. Okay, stop. Don't uh, disconnect all those things, and now take the output of the addition unit and connect it to the input of whichever register, and set the register to be. Uh, writing data instead of reading data. B, load in next instruction and start doing the whole thing again. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the clock, right, is something in hertz, right? And for a modern processor, well, what's the, you know, how fast is this thing operating? Yeah. What's the frequency of the clock? Gigahertz, right? Yeah. No, because it's not relativistically fast. Well, okay, and and actually, no. Just being quote fast in time does not mean that relativity is somehow involved, right? When does special relativity kick in or, or general relativity? Okay, when you are physically moving very fast, like, you know, significant fractions of the speed of light. Well, okay, uh, yeah, the electrons that are flowing through the wires. Yeah, no, I don't think you really have to, you don't have to consider relativistic stuff here. Um, yeah. 
well, okay, because like even if the, the, the maybe here's a different way to think about it, right? If the clock is operating at one hertz, that doesn't mean that the electrons are going slower, right? The electrons are going the electron speed, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, so compared to the speed of light, our clock speed is basically like forever, right? And so now, if we had a computer that could operate at gajillion of hertz, well, or something quantum, then yeah, we might have to worry about that. Okay. Now, that said, that does actually bring up one other issue with timing, which is called clock skew. Okay, so... Uh, for example, when you guys were building the, the the equality checker, right? How did you do that? What was the secret sauce? In XOR, right? And that would do it for one bit. So you also how how many other things did you have? You had seven more of these things. Okay. For sake of demonstration, let me draw. I won't draw the symbol, but I'll draw it like this. Let me just draw four of them. Okay. And then how do, so each one of them would tell you if one bit is equal to one bit, but then how do you tell if all eight bits are equal? You have to and all of these results. So all eight of the inexors have to be on for the 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 two bits to be or the two bit patterns to be equal, right? Okay. So how did you do this in Logisim? Well, there's two options. One option is could I just put a cascading series of and gates like this? Right? Would that work? Yes. Okay. However, so let's think about this. Let's say that I connect bits, or my two numbers to this thing. Okay? And let's say at time zero, the inputs are connected to this side. At what time does the output flip from, so let's say I put in two numbers that are equal. Okay? How long does it take, so if I connect the, the inputs at time zero, then the output here is going to flip from a zero to a one, okay, if the two numbers were equal. When does it flip from zero to one? Is it at time zero? No, of course not. Nothing's instantaneous. All right, now, it's very, very, very quickly after time zero, right? But these things just don't magically instantly work, right? It takes a very, very small amount of time before that thing on the other side is going to flip from a zero to a one, okay? And that amount of time, in this case, is going to get slowed down because how many layers of gates does it have to go through? <clears throat> three layers. Well, what, uh, maybe three isn't all that big, but what about if it had to go through a layer of like 70 of these things? And each one is like a picosecond delay. Right? It's going to slow things down. Okay, now, a picosecond, or now I'm just making up that number here, is a very, very, very small increment of time. But, <clears throat> well, okay, maybe let's rephrase this. Let's say that my processor is operating at one gigahertz. Okay. <clears throat> so that means it goes on, the clock goes on and off once every how many? What's the time unit if it's operating at one gigahertz? Hmm? It's really tiny, but what is it? How do we calculate that? Well, what is giga? Well, okay, so, no, nine, right? So, kilo 
is the 3, mega is 6, giga is 9, tera is 12. Okay. Um, these things aren't operating that fast. All right, so let's just say it's 1 gigahertz on the nose. I'm just picking that number for convenient arithmetic. So that means that it takes 1 over that, 1 over a billion, okay, or 10 to the minus 9 seconds, okay. 10 to the minus 9, what unit goes with that one? So we've gone up the chain from 3, 6, 9, but what's, what's 10 to the minus 3 would be micro. 10 to the minus 6 is nano. Minus 6 is nano. Uh, okay, so what, 10 to the minus, so this is nanoseconds. No, micro, well then what's 3? Oh, duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, milli, micro, and then uh, nano. Yeah. So this is one nanosecond. Okay. That's assuming it's operating at one, uh, one uh, gigahertz. Okay. All right. Now, if these gate delays are on the order of picoseconds, and you have a chain of 70 of these, is this going to be a problem? No, because 70 picoseconds is far smaller than one nanosecond, right? Because what would be a nanosecond in picoseconds? Yeah, so one nanosecond is 1,000 picoseconds, right? So 70 picoseconds versus 1,000 is negligible, right? But what about if I'm starting to clock this thing up to 5 gigahertz? Well, then I've only got 200 picoseconds. To work with, right? Oh, maybe this is starting to get to danger zone. Yeah, possibly. Okay, um, and this, by the way, is why I don't think we're going to see processors going significantly faster than, say, five to ten gigahertz, because eventually physics takes over, and physics is a cruel mistress. Um, now, that said, so how have processors gotten faster, even if we hit this sort of uh, frequency limitations? Okay, we can make them more efficient so that they do more things in the allotted amount of time. But how have processors evolved, say, over the last 20 years, consumer-grade processors? Huh? So they're now 64 bits. Cole just said it. There's multiple cores, right? So you start to parallelize. Instead of having one thing that operates, like, so which would you rather have? One thing operating at 10 gigahertz or eight things each operating at 4 gigahertz? Well, it depends on what you're doing, right? If you want to play a game, which one would you rather have? You'd want to have the 10 gigahertz one, okay, because most games only really use a single core or maybe a couple of them. Okay, now, nowadays that's starting to change, but you would want, like, gaming is better on single core performance. Well, no, it's just that there's not much to be parallelized, right? But let's say you're doing a video editing, then which one would you want? Mm-hmm. Because video editing is something that you can parallelize, okay? But, so hang on one second. Not everything can be parallelized, right? So video editing, if you're trying to go through and like, um, you know, maybe make it sort of give it like a black and white tone that you're trying to make a video all look all old-fashioned or something, then if you've got eight cores, could you just split the, each image into eight chunks and have each core deal with one of the chunks, and then just assemble everything back at the end. Yeah, right? And wouldn't that go a lot faster than just having one core do everything? Yeah, but that's a very parallelizable problem. Not all problems are parallelizable. For example, childbirth. If it takes one woman nine months to gestate a child, 
You can't have nine women each gestate one-ninth of the child over a month and then assemble the parts at the end. Huh? Well, okay, maybe you can, but it's called reading Frankenstein, right? Okay, but that is not a parallelizable process, right? You just, it doesn't work that way. Uh, right. <laughs> well, this is why you the, the video guy just buys the computer, right? And he's not designing the processor to put in his own video editing rig. They are. They're starting to take advantage of that, right? So, for example, in your game, right, you could have your AI working on one core and the game itself working on another core or something. The trouble, and this is, this is why parallel computing is hard, is you gotta keep all of those things synchronized. Ah, right, because you can't have your AI just doing its thing, right? Like, so keeping everything synchronized is hard, right? And if you wanna learn more about this, I invite you to take a parallel computing class or high performance computing and well, maybe it'll get offered as a topics class next year. I don't know, right? Yeah, but I mean, this is a serious problem. How do you, if you've got multiple cores or multiple independent computers, how do you utilize that and keep everything synchronized so it doesn't all get jacked up? That's not trivial, right? Okay, now maybe for something like video de editing, where it's pretty, maybe there it's pretty obvious, but it's not like, just because it's pretty obvious doesn't mean it takes one line in C to do it, right? Right, that's the other difference, right? Is that video encoding, if it, it doesn't have to happen live, right? If it takes three hours to process a video and you're not gonna sh show it until tomorrow, no problem. Okay, but if you're trying to do something live, like in a video game or a newscast or something like that, it's got to be fast. Right, right. That you're going to get fired from the news station if that happens, right? Okay, so lastly, I want to show you something because it's really cool and I'm proud that I managed to get it to work. So, I have here a relatively simple breadboard to which I have connected um, three buttons, or two buttons, well, I've got a third that I just put into test, but two buttons and two lights, okay? Nothing fancy. Yeah? All right. Well, I can do one better because you see this little ribbon? You know the GPIO pins on your Raspi's? That's what this thing is designed to connect to. So let me connect my fair ribbons here. That's why I bought, brought my office pie. Okay, now you guys probably can't see this, but um, right now you can see, uh, or Chad can describe it, the green light is on, okay? So I just connected the green light from directly from power to ground, and I put a 220 ohm, res or th sorry, a 330 ohm resistor in between, so I don't burn it out, right? It's on, great. That just tells me my circuit is powered. And then I also have this blue light over here that when I press this button, the blue light turns on, right? Okay, so let's see if I can get this kind of, all right, so you guys can kind of see it, yeah? All right, now the red light, if I press one of these two buttons, does the red light come on? No. Wait just one second. Oops. Okay, don't pay attention to that. But now watch it. Oops, wrong one. 
Sorry. Ah, the red light's coming on. Why is it coming on? Right. Yeah, okay, now I just quit the program. If I hit the button, does the red light turn on? No. So I've done software control GPIO. Okay, so I'll talk about how I did it, but what I'm basically doing is I've told the computer to check. Uh, so there are, you know, however many of those GPIO pins, and I can connect various things to each one. I can set them to be inputs. I can set them to be outputs. So I picked here um, three of those pins, and I'm going to use two of them as input and one of them as output. And I've got two of them connected to buttons and I've got them pulled high, so what that means is they're default one, and then when I hit the button, it gets pulled low, and the, so I would read the change from a one to a zero to indicate that the button has been pressed. That may feel backwards, kind of is, but it's okay, right? It's just a bit, it can be whichever way. Uh, and then the output, if I turn a certain bit to a one, then that red light, that pin is gonna get powered up and that red light will turn on, okay? So my program here, let me open it. Hmm? Yeah, well, and that's not even all of it because I also needed, um, this, okay, this is something that the book authors wrote, not this book, the other book, the Pyatt book. This guy has his own version of the code, but I used Pyatt's instead of this guy's, just because I'd been working from it, working with it from last year. Okay, so this looks like a whole bunch of gobbledygook, and it kind of is, right? But let's look at my version, my part of the program, and kind of think of what I'm doing, right? The first thing is I initialize all the pins to be, you know, which ones are inputs, which one are outputs, okay? I've got to initialize that at the beginning the same way that you might load in particular numbers for use in arithmetic, okay? And the, um, so that, let me blow this up so it's a little easier for you guys to read. Um, oops. All right, so for example, um, I have to initialize all of them, right? And I've got to initialize each pin independently, independently. Mm, yeah, I couldn't resist. Okay, and then my main loop is basically going through and it's checking each of the bits of the two buttons and saying, which bits were high or low, okay? And so if one of those bits goes from a high to a low, well, that's these two TBZs. If it goes from high to low, then I know that that button has been pressed and I want to activate one of the subroutines, okay? Now I've got two buttons here, one of them connected to uh, one pin and another connected to another, and for the pins that I picked, I have to check bit number 13 or bit number 26 of a particular register, okay? Um, and I just did two buttons, so I have one button that if you press it, it'll turn on the red light, and if that button is not pressed, it'll turn the red light off, and then the other button I just made terminate the program. Okay, uh, and I did that so that I, if I quit the program by hitting control C, uh, if I didn't turn off the light before I did that, then the light would stay stuck on. Uh, well, until I went back in the software and turned it off, right? Or until the sun goes nova, right? Hmm? 
Yeah, or the electricity goes out, right? Um, yes. Till the end of the universe, Farden, that LED will be on. Yeah, might as, that, that's close enough to the end of the universe for, I think, our purposes. Well, or until we nuke ourselves into oblivion. Right. That could happen any day now, right? Especially with the situation in Ukraine. I don't know if any of you guys have been following the news much, but I'm not much of a betting man, but Russia is making some really serious uh, moves. Like, you know, there's like close to 200,000 units of uh, people of Russian military near to the Ukrainian border. I don't know about you, but that smells like an, an imminent invasion. Yeah, so anyway. Okay, now, how the hell did I actually do this? So the way that – okay, I'm working on a device in Linux, right? Linux takes devices and it maps them to memory, okay? So if I want to write – a one to the appropriate bit to turn one of these lights on or off, what I'm really doing is writing to a memory cell, okay? Or at least that's what I think I'm really doing, okay? So if I write to certain memory addresses, they're not actually memory addresses in RAM. They're sort of an alias for actually going out to a different chip that's on the, the Raspberry board. Okay, so this is called memory mapping, and it's a technique that's quite old. Okay, so uh, if I want to write to the GPIO, then I have to write to certain bytes of memory, or at least that's how it appears to my software. But then the hardware, there's a thing called a memory mapper unit, or MMU, says, oh, you were just trying to write to this address. Well, that's not really a RAM address. That's over here connected to the light control stuff. And so it sends the data there instead of to actual RAM. Okay. Um, okay. So there are a crap ton of registers that are um, – oh, there's – yeah. Yeah. So I don't know who traveling de desk – Traveling Desi is, but there we've got some people. Oh, I've got more spam, a bot, but there's some other people connected here. Build a baby workshop, Chad, and red light, green light, CS version. So, yeah, I don't know who those people are, but or why they're not here in the room with us if they're supposed to be in the room, or if they're just people on Twitch who, you know, have found our random uh, CS channel teaching, right? Be sure to like and subscribe, uh, and unfortunately, today's the last broadcast of the semester, so I'll see you in January. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, be sure to mash that like button and hit the bell to see when our next video is. How am I doing there, Chad? Yeah, pretty good? Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, right, so how the hell did I actually do this? Well, I need to know what those special memory addresses are, okay? And how did I find out what they are? Well, that means going and digging into a manual for the Broadcom system on chip, right? So here they all are, right? And how they're connected to memory, or sorry. So these guys are all memory mapped to FE2000000 and then so on, right? Okay. And there's a bunch of these different registers because I have uh, 58 GPIO pins, each of which has three bits to select which function it takes on, input, output, or there's some other specialized functions you can do with some of them. Okay, And so that takes however many memory cells. And then I've got some registers to set whether or not their outputs or, uh, are set high or low. Output clears, pin levels, where, that's how I read them, uh, whether or not I can detect falling or rising or falling edges, high or low, asynchronous, and then for the outputs, I can also say if I want to have a, have a pull up or pull down resistor, um, and you have to have that with a button because otherwise uh, 
Well, you have to have resistors because otherwise you fry the thing, right? Because you have too much current. Okay, so point being though, there's a crap ton of these registers and I had to dig into the manual for the Broadcom system on chip version that the Raspi 4 uses to find what the heck those numbers were. Okay, it sounds worse than it is, but basically there was a lot of reading manual. Okay, um, which I know, um, and Marilyn uh, will, will excuse you from this, but I know that for the rest of us as men, we are genetically predisposed to never read the instruction manual, right? That's the first thing we throw away before we even throw away the box, right? That a thing comes in. We throw away the instruction manual. Not true? Yeah, okay. So anyway, but sometimes you have to RTFM, right? Huh? Uh, no, it's not an instruction manual. It's a data sheet, right? So, um, so let me just show you what I mean there. Um, Broadcom 2711 is the SOC for this thing, right? So I have to go to... Oh, right. Forgot that. One moment, please. What? No. The little red thing? No. It's just a breadboard. There's no Arduino here, right? Oh, no, that's not what I want. So I got to go sifting through this. Yeah. So Wednesday of break. Wow. Wow. Mm. I mean, that's worse than Chad Steezy, right? Okay. But there's a crap ton of this stuff that I have to go through. And okay, now not all of this is relevant to the GPIO stuff, but what we have to do is I have to find where the, okay, DMA controller, general purpose IO, chapter five, okay? And let me blow this up a little bit so it's a little bit easier to read, right? Okay, so it's got some circuit diagram stuff that talks about the registers and, and how the stuff is, but then it also tells me the base address and the offsets and what all of the registers are, and then it tells me what, what bits mean what, okay? And so I just had to go through and read and digest all of this stuff and set it up in my program, okay? Um, and so the, yeah. Okay, now, where Larry Pyre's, uh, his memory mapper, which is this thing, okay? What this is doing for me, oops, okay? is, and, and let me find exactly where it is, um, is um, it's basically trying to, uh, basically it's requesting permission from Linux to, uh, to have control of, or to be able to access those memory addresses, okay? Now, what happens if you try to access mem a memory address that you're not allowed to by the OS? What usually error do you get? You usually get the seg fault, right? Because you're, you know, out of bounds of what the, the operating system has given your program. But you can request to go outside of those bounds, okay? And the memory addresses that are required to access those GPIO pins are normally out of bounds. So his program basically just maps them and by requesting permission from the operating system. Okay, the other thing I had to do is you notice that when I executed this, I ran it with sudo. I have to run it with sudo uh, to do this, to, to, to operate on memory. Now there's a second way to do this that doesn't require sudo. That's what the other guy does, which is where Linux 
for safety allows you to write to what looks to you like a file on the hard drive, but it in the background sends it to the appropriate register. Okay, so that's the safe way to do it, which does not require pseudo permissions. Okay, so what I did at the very beginning was of my program is I just, well, I've got a whole bunch of data here, but right there, BLIO init, that's his function that initializes the IO and gets permission from Linux so that I can access those memory addresses. And then I do stuff with them. Well, okay, what do I do when I terminate the program? Well, if I can get permission from Linux, I should release it when I'm done. Yeah? Okay, and that's what I have in my terminate line. Okay, is basically turning all the LEDs back off and releasing control back to the OS of these, of these memory addresses. So he's got an init, but he also has a close, and so I call that down to my terminate routine. Um, then the light would stay on, okay, um, or, yeah, basically I would, I would, it would be stuck, so to speak, until I restart the program, okay. So, anyway, um, but you'll notice, like, what kind of operations am I basically doing here? Loading, some logical shifting, okay, we never talked about this one, but bit clear, um, that's not particularly complicated, logical or storing. Right, it's most, most of the instructions that we've used before. The bit clear is a different one, but that's not rocket science. Okay, all right, so this has been a fun semester. We have not gotten quite as far as I wanted to, but say la vie, things happen. Uh, but I've got good news for you, other than when is our final? Monday at 13.30, where? Here, okay. Um, and if only your dear professor had written up a very nice exam prospectus and posted it on Canvas right underneath the picture of the processor. No. You get one fewer day. Yeah, okay. So, uh, in particular, what is not on the exam? Yeah. Any of the Logisim stuff? Woo! Yeah, baby. I thought about putting it on there, but then I was like, well, I just started talking about it on Tuesday, and the exam is Monday. That's less than a week to put something on the final. That's maybe a little too cruel. Well, if you think about it, we haven't been talking about assembly that long either, so. <laughs> Relatively short time. Yeah, okay. So, no, there will not, none of this circuitry stuff will be on it. So, um,. However, so those, some of you guys will have comps soon, and who knows, right? I'm going to pull a graduate school and say, some stuff may be on comps that we didn't talk about in class. Have fun. So anyway, yeah, so please have a look at the exam prospectus. I'm not looking to crush anybody here, but I also expect you to not be a bonehead. Okay, so yeah. All right, uh, it's been a fun semester. I can't believe it's already over. Um, I guess I'll see you guys next time.